Nothing but a web of lies. Every bit of it. A web of lies. Good morning, everyone. This is Stone Gasman, live from New York City. And this morning, we are going to be doing a commentary, 50th anniversary commentary for the 1972 Swedish movie produced, written, and directed by Ingmar Bergman uh, called Cries and Whispers. Uh, this was a huge art house hit in 1973 that uh, even got uh, some Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture. And at that time, it was really unheard of for foreign language films uh, to not only just get an Oscar nomination for foreign language film, but let alone get uh, for best picture. And in fact, this is the fourth film in history to have gotten a best picture nomination from another country. Now, I've had my experience with Bergman in the past. I, um, I've seen the two, uh, the two important ones, the two very famous ones, which include the Seven Seal, and Wild Strawberries. And I'll be perfectly honest, the movie that got me interested in watching The Seven Seal, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, that hilarious sequence where they're playing all of these board games with death, like uh, Battleship, uh, a Twister, you know, you know, those kind of things. And in the original Seven Seal, of course, the whole joke was that death was having a chess game with this Swedish soldier played by Max von Sydow. And after I saw Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, my father told me, oh, yeah, this is from a movie called The Seventh Seal. Yeah, the last movie on earth you would have ever expected a Bill and Ted movie to reference was an Ingmar Bergman film from 1957. But I watched it uh, because of Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, and I liked it a lot. And I also saw Wild Strawberries, which is another one of his big films. Outside of those two, however, I mean, I've seen The Virgin Spring, which was later remade as uh, Last House on the Left by uh, Wes Craven and Sean S. Cunningham. And I've probably seen maybe one or two others that I would have to double check, but I've seen maybe about three or four Bergman films. Uh, the ones I haven't seen, however, I will explain that I probably will not be visiting a few of those just because of what I saw today with Crimes and Whispers. But look, you know, I, I knew that I had to do Cries and Whispers because this was a, a massive art house film. You know, critics adored it in 1972, just straight up adored it. And especially when it finally hit the Cannes Film Festival and was released in Sweden, you know, uh, in April of 1973, uh, that's when, you know, it kind of solidified itself as a classic, especially among uh, Bergman files and especially, um, you know, cin uh, cinephiles as well. However, I'm going to have a decidedly mixed reaction to this. And on that note, we are paused on the Criterion logo for Crimes and uh, Whispers. Let's go ahead and get started. So we will start at three, two, one, and play. And there, of course, is the Criterion logo. Uh, they also released Love in the Afternoon, which I did, for, uh, directed by Eric Romer, which came out last week. Uh, and I liked significantly better than this. <laughs> uh, just got back from seeing The Godfather in the theaters, and they only charged five seventy-five. dollars Well worth the eight. You know, that's awesome, Cliff. That, that is absolutely awesome. I'm so glad that you saw... Uh, Godfather in the theaters. I actually plan on seeing Solaris uh, next month at the uh, New York Film Festival, and uh, I'll be doing a 50th anniversary commentary on that uh, eventually. But, uh, okay, Sven Nick, uh, Nickfist, one of the most famous of all cinematographers, he's actually the only one that got an Academy Award for this film, and very well deserved, even though I have my uh, issues with the color schemes <laughs> in this movie. I mean, I Look, okay, so here's, I think we should start with this film with basically, look, there are some striking images throughout this movie. I mean, that is one thing I have to give it credit for. And part of that, though, is because of the fact that a lot of uh, Ingmar Bergman films before this one uh, were in black and white. This one, as you can see, was filmed in Eastman color 
copyright 1972, Cinematography Svenska. Yes. And here we have a statue. Now, let's see. Let me just try to find this real quick. I read about this opening here real quick. It, it opens up with a, a really cool statue in these foggy scenes in uh, basically in the Swedish countryside. But, um, wait a minute. oh, that's right. I'm in the wrong. <laughs> All right. Hold on one second. But I mean, these are some actually some really lovely shots of uh, the Swedish countryside and everything. Um, hmm. Okay, according to okay, the statue in the prologue may be Apollo or Orpheus. If the artistic doomed Agnes, who uh, plays uh, a cancer victim in this movie, matches Orpheus as well as Bergman, Agnes's mother may correspond to Eurydice, representing the green world. Uh, P. Adam Sidney, that's the, the, the guy that uh, wrote that, he concluded that cries and whispers tells an Orphic transformation of terror into art, of the loss of the mother into the musical richness of aut autumn, autumnal color. So, and, and that's the thing. We have we have a lot of uh, shots of clocks. We actually hear a lot of clocks in this movie, um, obviously indicating the passage of time, which is becoming a little bit more painful uh, for these women day after day. But here's the here's the setup for cries and whispers. Uh, yeah, uh, as you can see, uh, these two actresses are basically uh, sleeping in very awkward positions. Uh, <laughs> just to start out with that. Um, now, uh, th this uh, actress right here who plays um, Agnes, uh, her name is Harriet Anderson. Uh, she's still with us. She was born in 1932. She, uh, she is 90 years old now and best known outside of Sweden for being a part of director Ingmar Bergman's stock company. Now, she began her acting career as a 15-year-old student at Kale Flygare Stage School, and she joined Ingmar Bergman for several stage productions at Malmo Stadsteater between 1953 and 56. In a 2008 interview with Mick LaSalle of the San Francisco Chronicle, Anderson debunked a rumor that she was discovered by Bergman while working as an elevator operator. Quote, in an elevator? Ha, that's not a new one for me. No, I did operate an elevator, but that was when I was 14 and a half. In Ingmar did not discover me. I was discovered in 1949 theater school before Monica I had many small parts. Most of them were a little like Monica. I looked that way. I looked like a bad girl, but I wasn't a bad girl, really. I was a very nice girl until I found out what life was. Bergman wrote the title role in Summer with Monica, specifically for Anderson here. Filmed in Sweden, the motion picture shows the romantic history of two disaffected youths from first meeting to a summer ideal, followed by their hasty marriage and subsequent divorce. And um, although the romantic relationship with Bergman was very brief, they continued to work together. Anderson appeared in several of his best film, best known films, including Smiles of a Summer Night. Now, I have seen Smiles of a Summer Night. In fact, I even owned it on VHS at one point uh, for two reasons. One, because I very much liked Woody Allen's uh, Midsummer Night Sex Comedy, which was based on Smiles of a Summer Night. And also because Leonard Malton in his film guide gave it four stars. And there was actually a time when I actually tried to order every four star movie that he had in his book on VHS just to check them out. I did not love Smiles of Summer Night. In fact, I think I only watched it once. And I kind of feel about that the way I do with uh, uh, The Virgin Spring, which is uh, one of the other Bergman, a few Bergman films I've seen. But after Cries and Whispers, you know, Bergman would make a series of films, including uh, Scenes of a Marriage, which we will talk about later. And, of course, uh, Fanny and Alexander, which both have alternate television cuts for uh, Swedish television. Now, Anderson appeared with Max von Sydow and Gunnar Bjornstrand uh, and played a latent schizophrenic in a movie called Through a Glass Darkly. The movie is taken from the verse in 1 Corinthians where Paul of Tarsus says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, 
but then I shall know even as I am also known. The plot deals with the actions of four persons during a 24-hour period in an old house a far distance out on the Swedish archipelago. Some audiences were shocked by Anderson's vivid portrayal of the presence of God as represented in the dark world of the schizophrenic. Like other Bergman associates, she's had a career in English language films, including performances in Sidney Lumet's The Deadly Affair, and later in Lars, uh, Lars von Trier's Dogville from 2003. She uh, did publish an autobiography, a, a set of interviews with Jan Lumholt, and that was pu published in 2006. And she has won a number of acting awards, including the Swedish Guild Bag Award, the Norwegian Amanda and Best Actress Awards on the Venice Film Festival, and the Ninth Moscow International Film Festival. In 1968, Anderson received the Bodil Award for Best Actress for her role in the Henning Carlson Danish comedy People Meet and Sweet Music Fills the Heart. Recently, Anderson won the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Stockholm International Film Festival in 2010. And see. and uh, she started out acting in 1949, uh, did movies like Beef and the Banana and U-Boat 39. And the last film she was in was actually Dogville, which I just mentioned. And that was uh, uh, nearly 20 years ago. So she's been uh, evidently happily retired uh, in uh, probably in uh, Stockholm. Uh, and like I said, she was only with Ingmar Bergman for a couple of years. And in fact, the woman who plays her sister, who is in the chair, is Liv Oldman, who has uh, uh, actually a, a lot uh, a lot more history with Ingmar Bergman, which we will talk about in a bit. <clears throat> uh, but she was also in relationships with Per Oskarsson, uh, the Swedish actor, Gunnar Hellström, and John Donner, all Swedish actors. And those are the first words that we hear. I mean, we're eight and a half minutes in. And those are the first words we hear in cries and whispers where she apparently, you know, she's waking up to uh, pain and everything. And now, okay, so the lady sitting in the chair is Liv Oldman. And the actress who just brought in the, um, the tea, I believe it is, uh, that is uh, Carrie Silwan who plays Anna. And finally, we have the fourth uh, uh, lead actress in this movie, uh, who is Ingrid Thulin, who plays Karen. Now, Karen and, and uh, Agnes and Maria, played by Liv Ullman, are all sisters, while Anna is basically the one that looks after uh, Agnes now that she is, uh, you know, uh, suffering a great deal. I see you there. There's Karen, you know, drinking the tea and uh, taking a look. And she's she's obviously very repulsed by uh, Agnes's state, even though it's her sister. And she almost is like barely looks at her. You know, she's like, OK, you know, this is going to be a long, drawn out process, which it has been. I mean, you know, she's been uh, from what I understand, she's been sick for a number of years now. And um yeah, and, and yeah, this is Anna right here, you know, starting the fire and everything. Um, now, <laughs> uh, now, according to Bergman, according to Ingmar Bergman, when he conceived of Cries and Whispers, now this is actually a very, very nice shot of this um, dollhouse, the Swedish dollhouse as Bergman basically goes down. And we're about to get flashbacks here. And, you know, it's it's actually, you know, this is almost like a, like a, an entrance way into these women's lives as we uh, go back into their histories. Not too much. See, one of my uh, issues with this movie is that we don't get near enough background on these sisters to actually, I, in my opinion, truly care about them. Now, understandably, a lot of people in 1973 and now would, would absolutely disagree. There's a lot of people that consider Cries and Whispers a masterpiece. I am not one of them. I, I am just not one of them. I, I mean, and, and see, I saw this film twice today. The, the first viewing and the second viewing didn't dis distinguish mu much from the first viewing. But let me let me just say this. I think that the first hour, the, the first hour of Cries and Whispers is very strong, very effective, uh, quite intoxicating. And then in the second half, I think it gets 
a, a bit too uh, repetitive. It gets a bit too uh, overindulgent. And because of the fact that I never really got attached to any of these women in the first place, it's kind of hard to feel for them after they've lost their sister to cancer. And I know, see, the thing is, is that I have a, I have a, an issue with a lot of uh, these art house films, which, you know, almost insist that you have to care about the characters just because they're already in a very emotional or devastating situation. Uh, one of my most incendiary opinions, and I will never, ever wave down from this. I think the, the most overrated movie of the 21st century, hands down, is this movie called Amour. It, it, it came out, it was a, a French movie, and um, it, came out in, it came out in 2012. And it, you know, it was also nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. It got foreign language film. The reviews for it were stellar. And to be perfectly honest, I think part of the reason why the reviews were so damn high for that movie was because of the fact that it featured two actors, two beloved actors of the French New Wave. And... And because the fact that critics were well aware of their reputation and their their backgrounds and everything, it's almost like they instantly fell in love with it. And look, maybe you just have to be a fan of French New Wave to actually dig a more. I found it excruciating. I hated these people. I couldn't wait for them to die. And and what the biggest frustration of all is that we learned so little about them. And it's almost like. It was almost like Michael Henneke who who did Amour. He wants me to care about them just because they're old and they're about to die. I could have given a shit less. And one of the biggest issues I had with that movie, which is one of the issues I have with this movie, is that the scenes feel like they go on forever. Certain scenes, like, they just... I, I kept on asking myself, okay, why? what is the point of this being so long when we're practically seeing the same, th uh, same thing all throughout the damn scene. And in the second half of Cries and Whispers, I must confess that there are several sequences where I really lost my patience and I found it a, a rather excruciating. We will get to those when we get to those. But look, I cannot deny that Ingmar Bergman has a, um, has a style that is very impressive. I admit that he... Um, and, and, and see, this was a film that came out after two you know, films that kind of failed for him. And this was actually a huge uh, awakening for his uh, career after, you know, several uh, duds at the box office. But this one just kind of captured critics uh, in America well before that it, uh, that it caught anybody in Sweden. Now, this is a flashback, obviously. Liv Ullman is, uh, you know, about to do some reading. And this is a whole segment which features... Um, well, one of Bergman's daughters appears as uh, the younger version, the the younger version of Maria, played by Liv Ullman, and this is the younger version of Agnes. As uh, and you know, you can tell by the uh, by the hair color change that you know this is obviously in the past, even though uh, Liv Ullman is uh, <laughs> well, she and uh, she and Ingrid Thulin, who played the sisters, and as well as Harry Anderson, they are all almost the same age, they're all in their early 40s when they did this. I remember another time one autumn when I hid behind the curtains and watched her in secret. She sat in her white dress in the red drawing room, and she sat quite still, her head bent, her hands resting on the table. Now, I like these ob observations. I, I actually really do, and I like how um, she ultimately notices her, you know, behind the curtains and uh, reacts to this. But, um, so... What was Bergman's inspiration for this? Well, he conceived the story during a very lonely, very unhappy time uh, uh, when he usually wrote constantly. He described a recurring dream of four women in white clothing in a red room, whispering to each other. He said that th this symbolized his childhood view of the soul as a faceless person who was, uh, who was black on the inside, representing shame 
and red on the inside. And it's funnily enough that in 1968, that he released a movie called Shame, which is considered one of his best films. The persistence of the vision indicated to Bergman that it could be a film, he said, and he planned a, quote, portrait of my mother, the great beloved of my childhood. Karen has the same name as Bergman's mother, but all four female protagonists are intended to represent aspects of her personality. So this is a movie ultimately that Bergman did, um, you know, in tribute to his mother, which is nice. I mean, and, and that's the thing, you know, this is a, you know, it's a gorgeous movie. I mean, look, Sven Nick, Nick Vest, you know, shoots the hell out of this movie. And I can understand because of the fact that they did a lot of black and white films. For this. this was essentially, I can't say for sure this was Bergman's very first color film, but because of the color, because of the striking use of color, in 1972, I think that's part of the reason why so many critics were so responsive to it. I think that's exactly part of the reason because they realized, okay, you know, these colors, you know, there's, you know, they're supposed to be symbolic and the, and everything. Well, let's put it this way: I got tired of the red. I got tired of the red and white colors uh, by the time of the second half of this movie. I just got tired of all the, you know, the crimson. Uh, the crimson transitions bef between scenes and everything. I think that Bergman just overdoes them. I mean, if there were like four or five and they were to set up pertinent flashbacks or pertinent details, I would be a little bit more impressed. But, you know, he does it like 20 times. And this is a 91 minute movie. So, I mean, just like after the seventh or eighth time, I got tired of him. I, I got tired of him. I was like, okay, Bergman, I got it. You know, I mean, we're, I mean, like I said, just flipping the pancake over and over, you know, in my opinion. But um, a childhood memory of the Sophia Hemet mortuary also influenced the director. The young girl who had just been treated lay on the wooden table in the middle of the floor. I pulled back the sheet. This is Bergman talking and exposed her. She was quite naked apart from a plaster that ran from throat to pudenda. I lifted a hand and touched her shoulder. I had heard about the chill of death, but the girl's skin was not cold, but hot. I moved my hand to her breast, which was small and slacked with an erect, erect black nipple. There was dark down in her abdomen, and she was breathing. Now, since Bergman's films were difficult to market, foreign capital was just unavailable, and he decided to shoot uh, Cries and Whispers in Swedish rather than English, as his previous film, The Touch, had been. Now, it's funny that his last film was called The Touch because there's a lot of touching in this movie. There's a lot of intimate touching, which isn't exactly sexual. I mean, but it, the, the touching in this movie, and, and, you know, here we go. I mean, right in this scene right here, we uh, there's a lot of touching. There's a lot of touching of the cheeks. There's a lot of touching of, of throats and, you know, you know, different parts of the body and everything. And, and the thing is, I mean, a lot of it is not necessarily sexual from what I understand, but, uh, you know, but anyway, so although uh, Bergman used 750,000 Swedish, um, uh, Swedish, uh, I guess, uh, money of his savings and borrowed 200,000 more, uh, the kroner, I believe that, yeah, the Swedish kroner is at it. And he also asked the Swedish Film Institute for help with the film's 1.5 million budget. This attracted some criticism uh, since Bergman was not an up and coming director in the greatest need of subsidy. To save money, the main actresses and Nick Fisk returned uh, their salaries as loans and were nominal co producers. In his book Images, Bergman wrote, quote, Today I feel that in Persona and later in Cries and Whispers, I had gone as far as I could go, and that in these two instances, when working in total freedom, I touched wordless secrets that only the cinema can discover. In an essay included with the Criterion DVD, critic Peter Cowie quoted the director, quote, all my films can be thought of in terms of black and white, except Crimes and Whispers. Well, I think that joke is kind of a, I think that, I think that quote is kind of a joke because, well, it's not black and white, it's red and white. Actually, to be more accurate, it's crimson and white. So it's, it's, 
it's not much of a stretch. <laughs> okay. Look, I, look, I get it. I mean, in 1972, critics were probably balled over by the use of color in this film. See, here we have another transition. Uh, it's, I mean, and that's the thing. The, the, the cover on the Criterion is basically Liv Ullman's face with uh, crimson all over the cover. So, you know, not, not necessarily subtle. I actually prefer the original posters, which some of them don't even have any crimson on them at all. You know, seriously. But, I mean, red was particularly sensitive, and cinematographer Sven Nickvist made many pho photography tests to capture balanced combinations of reds, whites, and skin colors. Here again. Not much, not, not much experimentation with the use of color in this movie, even though on the surface, there appears to be a lot of experimentation with it, just because it's really the first time that Bergman used color on film. To the disappointment of the Swedish Film Institute members, Bergman refused to shoot in their new expensive studios and filmed on location at Taxing Nasby Castle. Since the mansion's interior was dilapidated, the crew was free to paint and decorate as they saw fit. Oh, okay. And uh, just to let everybody know, that castle is a stately home in Sweden. And uh, during the 2010s, uh, Hela Sverga Baka was recorded there. Otherwise, that's all the information I can find on it. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's where um, that's where that was filmed. Now, the, the gentleman here playing... Okay, now, I look, obviously this was very intentional to showcase Liv Ullman's... Uh, uh, cleavage. Uh, I was like, oh, oh, doctor, did you notice the cleavage? Come on. I mean, look, it's a bit too obvious that, look, that, that uh, these two individuals had an affair before and now she's kind of like, you know, let, 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 come on, let's get, let's get dirty again. <laughs> you know? And he's just kind of ignoring her, just enjoying his food. And, and ultimately we will discover why the hell he rejects her, even though she's coming on very, very strong with her, uh, her cleavage and her demeanor and her, uh, you know, just, you know, and he's barely looking at her. You know, he's barely making eye contact with her, you know, just like enjoying his wine and his food. And it's like, you know, dude, come on. I mean, <laughs> you better have a good reason to, sh to like uh, <laughs> deny this woman <laughs> any kind of uh, lovemaking. But um, of course, we're going to find that out in a minute. Uh, let's see now. Okay. So the gentleman here playing David is a man by, uh, by the name of Erland Josephson. And, uh, he passed away in 2012. He was best known by international audiences for his work with not only Ingmar Bergman, but also Andrei Tarkovsky and Theodorus Angelopoulos. Probably master of that, but I apologize. Now what he is best known for and this is part of the reason why I'm gonna like I'm gonna let everybody know right now. Okay, the film that Ingmar Bergman made after *Cries and Whispers* featured both Stevenson, Erlen Josephson, excuse me, who plays David, and Liv Ullman here, who plays Maria. Now, scenes from a *Marriage*, from everything I've read, is basically about Ingmar Bergman's and Liv Ullman's relationship and how it deteriorated over 10 years' time. Now, nothing against Liv Ullman, nothing against Ingmar Bergman. Seriously, and I mean that from the heart. I don't give a goddamn about their relationship. I don't, I don't, I, look, I do not want to watch a movie about a marriage, a disintegrating marriage over the course of three hours uh, featuring two assholes who probably never should have been together in the first place. And that's part of the reason why I didn't bother with Marriage Story, despite all of the acclaim that that movie got. And the, the thing is, is that I can't see that's how I, I, I can't help but feel that way. I have zero desire to see a movie about a crumbling marriage over the course of three goddamn hours. I will not do that. OK, and, and look. I understand that the praise for Cries and Whispers as well as Scenes of a Marriage is practically unanimous among uh, scholars and, and uh, cinephiles and everything. And believe me, I, I did read up on Scenes of a Marriage, and I realized after watching this sequence that I just, no, I can't do it. 
I, I can't do it. I mean, somebody would have to pay me to do a commentary on scenes of a marriage. I, I just, uh, I'd rather do a commentary on the Russian version of War and Peace. And that is eight hours long. I'd rather do that. Okay. So look. I'm sure Liv Ullman and and uh, Earl Josephson, I, I, I'm sure they give magnificent performances in scenes of a marriage. I'm sure they do. I don't give a goddamn. I don't care about Bergman's and Ullman's relationship. I don't care to see a marriage disintegrate over 10 years' time. And, and I, I definitely don't care about what the hell they talk about during that time. So, I mean, now, an exception to that, would be uh, the film Revolutionary Road, directed by Sam Mendes, which the difference between that and something like Marriage Story or even uh, Scenes of a Marriage is that it's based on, a, on a, a legendary American novel, which was long overdue to be adapted, long overdue. And Revolutionary Road is actually a, 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 a really depressing, but at the same time, very illuminating look at 1960s, at the 1960s and the marriages and how people realized that they were in, you know, experiencing doldrums. And, you know, a lot of them basically said, well, look, what was the point of getting married when we're about to get divorced now? So, okay. Now in this entire sequence, Erland uh, Josephson is David, uh, this doctor who has tended to not only Agnes, but also Anna's uh, child who apparently died a few years before and so he basically says, you know, like, you know, you're, you know, the lines on your face and everything. You don't, you're a very different woman now, giving all these, you know. <laughs> and of course, she uh, she just says, uh, I've been so bored with your, I, I, I'm always so bored with your arguments. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> now this is um, apparently Liv Ullman's uh, or Maria's husband. Uh, back when the doctor first visited and they actually had an affair together. Uh, his name is Joachim, and he's played by uh, Henning Moritzen. Uh, and he also passed away in 2012. And he was uh, a Danish actor, and he appeared in more than 70 films between 1950 and 2010. Among them, uh, Suzanne, 1950, Adam and Eve, 1953, Crazy Paradise, uh, Venus uh, Fra Vestro, and I'm trying to look for any kind of American uh, or English titles here. And unfortunately, uh, the the one with the with well, I mean, he made mostly Danish movies. He made mostly Danish movies. Now, uh, Liv Allman, on the other hand, has had quite a career. And you know, she's considered one of the great European actresses. Um, I can't say that necessarily after watching this film. Uh, I would have to watch more of her. And and here again, I mean, the, the thing is, is that I don't want to watch Scenes of a Marriage. And I don't want to watch Crimes and Whispers again. So uh, what does that leave us? Well, uh, with Ingmar Bergman, she also made Persona, Hour of the Wolf, and Shame. And at least two of those are considered masterpieces like this one. She played Anna in The Passion of Anna in 1969. But she was also in movies like Cold Sweat, directed by Terrence Young in 1970. She was also in the 1973 film Lost Horizon, which was actually considered one of the worst films of its day, a remake of the uh, Frank Capra uh, classic. She was also in A Bridge Too Far, 1977, directed by Richard Attenborough. Uh, uh, Gabby, A True Story, The Girlfriend of the Rose Garden, the Danish poet, The Ox, which was actually directed by Sven Nykvist. And he and she was also in The Long Shadow, directed by Vilmos Zygmunt. Uh, and he uh, actually shot one of the movies I just did a commentary on uh, very recently. And she's also directed, Liv Ullman has also directed, she directed Sophie in 1992, as well as Private Confessions, Faithless. And the last film she directed was actually in 2014 called Miss Julie. And that came from uh, uh, Columbia TriStar. And who played Miss Julie? Well, it was Jessica Chastain. And uh, the movie also had Colin Farrell and Samantha Morton. And uh, Liv Ullman not only wrote the movie, but she also directed it uh, based, on a, um, based on a naturalistic play written in 1888 by August Strindberg. However, since that movie... Uh, she's been pretty much out of the spotlight. Uh, she was showcased in a documentary called Live and Ingmar, 
which was about their relationship. I'd rather watch that than scenes of, from a marriage. And um, and here we have the husband basically uh, attempting suicide. Uh, he didn't die. I don't think he did die in this story. But yeah, he attempted suicide when he found out that his uh, wife was basically uh, had a, an affair with a doctor. And um, I don't know. And, and again, another crimson transition. I mean, we... These crimson transitions, I swear, I get so tired of them after a while. I just like, and like I said, there's 20 of them in this movie. Like, you couldn't have, like, switched it up a little bit. You couldn't have, like, I don't know. I mean, were, were people in 1972, were they really just totally bowled over by the crimson transitions? See, here we have one that was immediately right after the other one. So, look, that's the frustrating or one of the frustrating aspects, I think, that uh, this movie has. It's just after a while, I got tired of the crimson. I just got really tired of it. And, he, you know, here again, going back to what Ingmar was saying about, you know, being, you know, his one of his first color films. Well, look, you went from black and white to crimson and white. Not much of a stretch. This is not much of a stretch. Sh sure, people in 72 were probably more impressed but there are still people today that consider this a masterpiece. They can still still consider this one of Bergman's absolute best films. I can't join that camp. I just can't. I, I don't. These two, the two sisters played by Liv Oldman and, um, uh, oh, man, who, who, who's uh, the other actress again? Um, uh, uh, did, 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 uh, Ingrid Thulin. Yeah, Ingrid Thulin, who plays uh, Karen. I felt almost nothing for these people. And and, and, and to be perfectly honest, the way they treat uh, Anna a little bit later in the story, you know, I just couldn't shake my head. I, I just sh shook my head and, and said, OK, look, and, you know, these these two women, you know, they're ultra privileged, you know, not, not necessarily bitches, but, you know, they're ultra privileged to the point where. I just didn't care. I didn't care about them or their situation or what they were going to do after their sister died. I didn't care about any of that. I mean, the truth of the matter is I was impressed enough with Harriet Anderson's performance as Agnes for um, a number of reasons. And we will see them here in um, uh, very, very soon. But, I mean, I liked uh, Carrie Silwan, who plays Anna, and Harriet Anderson, who plays Agnes, I like both of them way more than I liked uh, Ingrid Tulin and Liv Oldman as uh, Corinne and Maria. Okay, I mean, I just felt I felt that these two characters were more, way more empathetic than the uh, than the than the sisters. Y you know, I mean, and and like I said, we'll get to what the uh, what to what the themes of the movie is when we get to the deep conversations between Ingrid and Liv, which go on forever. You know, I mean, they just go on forever and I get so impatient with them now. But here's um, here's a moment right here now. Yeah. OK. As you can see, that's <laughs> uh, Carrie Silwan, who plays um, Anna right here, uh, comforts Agnes uh, by uh, opening up her her frock, her uh, her blouse or whatever she's uh, wearing. And basically, they have this very, very intimate moment, which isn't exactly sexual. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the things I kind of was taken aback by. Because when I first saw this, I was like, oh, OK, so she, she's having a, an affair with the maid. OK, that, OK, you know, no problem. And she and she loves him. And then, OK, they have to suppress it and everything. Not exactly. That, that That's not exactly what uh, 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 Bergman was going for here. Uh, let's see. Where's the paragraph I saw in this? Give me one moment here. Okay. Professor Emma Wilson described the family's predicament with Karen feeling endangered by touch and Maria seeking an, an erotic touch. Uh, however, Maria is repelled by Agnes's decay and her dead body. Rushman explained Karen's repulsion to touch as a result of her degree of isolation and restraint. The scene where Anna cradles Agnes, 
which we just saw, suggests that touch and sensation are soothing despite the, quote, opaque question of their relationship, which may be comparable to sisterhood. And, and that's why I'm saying is that, I mean, if if she like took all off all her clothes and even even took off her clothes at the same time, okay. So obviously they have a sexual relationship, but <clears throat> you know, even before I read that, even before that I read that, I was just kind of curious, like, okay, so she's opening up her blouse, but there's not, there's nothing, anything really sexual about it. it it's just, like I said, it's like what I just uh, read that the relationship is very opaque and that, uh, you know, it's very comparable to sisterhood, even though she has two genuine sisters who would probably appreciate it even more. But uh, no, 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 no. She, I mean, her, uh, her connection is very strongly with Anna. And, um, you know, obviously they have a history together. Now, earlier we saw during one of the flashbacks, you know, there was a, a little like play presentation and everything. It was uh, basically a magic lantern show. And the sisters, what they were basically viewing was Hansel and Gretel. And like that story, at least according to what I'm reading here, is that like Hansel and Gretel, it reveals Agnes's feelings of abandonment and her mother's favoring of Maria. Uh, uh, the Brothers Grimm story of si sibling unity contrasts the sisters' estrangement. Fair enough. Cinema historian P. Adam Sidney wrote that Hansel and Gretel's parents abandoned them in the forest, symbolism, and Agnes's cancer is the equivalent of the witch in the Brothers Grimm tale. Now, it is true that she uh, suffers from uh, cancer of the uterus, and we will go back to that. <laughs> we will we'll go back to that. Uh, Karen's cutting of her vulva. Yes, that actually happens later in the movie, means that her husband will not have sex with her, and the red wine symbolizes blood from the womb. Tom Quist wrote that Karen's transfer of blood from her vulva to her mouth means that she will neither have sex nor speak, and preventing communication and reinforces loneliness. Yes, this actually happens. Sydney wrote that the family is most united when reading Charles Dickens' The Pickwick Papers, which they are going to be doing very, very soon which describes, quote, male solidarity and chicanery threatened by female plots for marriage. According to Frank Gato, detachment returns after Agnes's funeral and it is dismissed without warmth or sympathy. See, that's what I'm saying is that, I, I mean, by the end of the film, I really had a lot of disgust for the sisters and zero reason to give a shit about them and their predicament. Uh, now, that the, now that their sister had died of uh, cancer of the uterus. But... Um, and film scholar Mark Gervais wrote that Cries and Whispers has no definitive a solution of whether suffering or death have any meaning, citing the pastor who expresses his own doubts and fears when he eulogizes Agnes. Uh, Gervais likened this to the protagonist of Bergman's earlier Winter Light, Bergman's own conflicted feelings and his relationship to his father, Eric, a minister of the Church of Sweden. And he also compared the ending to that of Bergman's 57 Wild Strawberries as a, quote, paints to the past a paradisiac existence in this life to the communion inherent in childhood that has later been lost, unquote. So here we have this, here again, very long sequence. I mean, it, Bergman really does draw this out. Um, this long sequence where, you know, obviously, you know, the, uh, you know, Agnes is in, you know, you know, she's suffering very badly. She's in a lot of pain right now. And and basically, and, and they try to contact the doctor. The doctor wasn't home, um, which probably explains why Liv is showing off her, uh, uh, <laughs> her, her, her cleavage again. Maybe she, she was hoping the doctor would come back, obviously. But um, here again, I just don't know why we have to learn about the relationship between her and the doctor when it's almost irrelevant. It's almost irrelevant when it comes to the the three sisters, which, in my opinion, this is what um, Bergman should have focused exclusively on. I think he should have focused exclusively on these on, on the three sisters and Anna. And, you know, not saying, you know, have no men in the film at all. But then again, like I said, this was one of those films where, you know, Bergman explores a lot of 
female psychology, female relationships, which is one of the reasons why he's considered one of the great directors. And um, obviously while, why he got a lot of praise for the women in his movies and for the performances they gave. Um, but look, I mean, Liv Ullman and uh, Ingrid Thulin as a Karen. Uh, I mean, look. Um, as good as they may be in these roles, I just didn't like them as people. In fact, I, I downright almost uh, uh, despise them as people by the end of it. I mean, here again, the second half of this movie, I, I just found more and more excruciating. And, uh, and it wasn't as if I found it excruciating during this very long sequence where, where Agnes has to, you know, basically dies, you know, and, and she's basically, you know, her, her voices you know, very uh, hoarse and, you know, she can't, you know, even speak. And, you know, she's just basically depending upon her sisters to give her some bit of comfort before she actually passes. And see here, they're reading, reading uh, the Pickwick uh, papers uh, for her. Uh, principal photography took place from uh, the 9th of September to the 30th of October in 1971. So, yeah, uh, basically approximately uh, uh, 51 years ago, this movie started shooting. Uh, Nick, uh, Nick Vist used Eastman color, which reduced graininess and would be the most sensitive to colors. Uh, let's see. And uh, Liv Ullman said that every scene was shot in natural light using large windows for indoor scenes. Harriet Anderson described the onset mood as light an antidote to the film's heavy subject matter. And she said that although she usually read the screenplay and went to bed early during the production, the filmmakers kept her awake late to enhance her tired, ill appearance, as you can see right now. The actress modeled her, modeled her death scene on the death of her father, and Bergman directed her deep, violent inhalations. Now, okay, now this move, uh, this moment right here is actually, very, you know, it's, it, I mean, this is one of the few uh, moments in the movie which I would say earns its power. And that's when, you know, she's, you know, she's screaming in pain. She's absolutely screaming, holding on to her stomach. And, you know, she's screaming for somebody to help her. And Liv Ullman just looks away and just puts her hands. Okay, I got to admit that that is a powerful moment. Uh, otherwise, after she dies, my interest uh, in this movie plunges. It just, it, you know, it flushes down the toilet. And it, it just, we have to deal with the sisters and how they, you know, deal with the death. And it just, oh, man, Ingmar Bergman just, just you know, he, he doesn't know where to quit with, with some of these scenes. He really doesn't. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. So, as, as I said before, uh, she's basically dying of uh, uterine cancer. And uh, I'm going to give a, uh, also known as womb cancer. And basically, here's a quick description of it. Let's see. Uh, it accounts for approximately 90% of all uterine cancers in the United States, endometrial cancer. Symptoms of endometrial cancer include changes in vaginal bleeding or pain in the pelvis. Symptoms of uterine sarcoma include unusual vaginal bleeding or a mass in the vagina. Risk factors for this cancer include obesity, meta uh, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, taking pills that contain estrogen without pro progesterone, a history of tamo uh, tamoxifen use, late menopause, and a family history of the condition. Risk factors for uterine sarcoma include prior radiation therapy to the pelvis. Diagnosis of endometrial cancer is typically based on a endometrial biopsy. I know I keep screwing that word up. A diagnosis of, of may be suspected based on symptoms of pelvic exam and medical imaging. It's often cured while uterine sarcoma typically is harder to treat. Endometrial cancer is often cured, but it, uh, treatment may include a combination of surgery, radiation, ther uh, radio radiation therapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and targeted therapy, none of which existed at the time that this movie was set in, because this is set in the uh, 
the late 20th century. In 2015, about 3.8 million women were affected globally and it resulted in 90,000 deaths. Endometrial cancer is relatively common, while uterine sarcomas are rare. In the United States, uterine cancers represent 3.5% of new cancer cases. They most commonly occur in women between the ages of 45 and 74, with a median age of diagnosis of 63. But as we... Um, as we obviously can see right here, uh, Agnes is uh, uh, gonna die pretty much uh, in her 40s. Um, yeah, and and I like this shot of the of the feet too, where they where they fix her legs I and mean, just look at the bottom of her feet of her feet, just to give an idea on how exact how, how much she suffered. Uh, and, and that's the thing is that if anything, despite my uh, issues with the second half of this movie. Look, Bergman, look, there's plenty of striking imagery here. And a lot of his films are noted for their striking imagery. This one, no less. And that's what I'm saying is that I, I got to confess that there are a lot of shots in this movie that I was definitely, definitely popped my eyes out. I mean, look, if anything, I can't say this movie was boring. I watched the movie twice and I can tell you right now, I did not find this movie boring. I just found it frustrating. I found it... and borderline excruciating in parts borderline excruciating in parts <laughs> on uh, march 25th 2022 liv oldman was presented with an honorary honorary academy award in recognition in recognition of her quote bravery and emotional transparency that has gifted audiences with deeply affecting screen portrayals. So she uh, she won an Oscar uh, finally this year. She's 83 years old now. And um, she was actually born in uh, Tokyo, Japan, and uh, uh, actually is from Norway. She's not from Sweden. She's actually from Norway. Now, okay, so we are approximately 48 minutes and 30 seconds into the movie. 48 minutes th and 30 seconds. This is the moment in the film. This is the moment where my attention started to wane and my interest in the story certainly began to wane. I mean, we have to hear this long, drawn-out eulogy. And look, look, to be fair to Bergman, you know, he does shift the camera. He does see, you know, all the different reactions of, of uh, Anna and the two sisters, which are important for this. But then when we go back to when we go back to the preacher, you know, look, I get it. I just I read earlier that, OK, no, the idea is that he doesn't know if. We, um, hold on a minute. <laughs> What's the. Uh, uh, well, I, I know I read it earlier. I, I mean, what uh, what? Oh, uh, I'll read it one more time. Here it is. Um, oh, forget it. That's not either. <laughs> now, I'll just read this. Um, Bergman was quoted as saying that he had a ceaseless fascination with the whole race of women in his mainsprings. Obviously, such an obsession implies ambivalence. It has something compulsive about it. However, he doubted that there was much difference between men and women. Quote, I think if I had made cries and whispers with four men in the leading roles, then the story would have been largely the same, unquote. Academic Laura Hubner agreed with Cine Action essayist Varda Burstein's view that cries and whispers depicts the suppression of women, but it does not endorse the suppression, and the film opposes patriarchy. Rushman uh, traced the emotional estrangement to the women's mother, who reacts to the heir's gender roles with boredom, anger, and frustration. According to Rushman, her daughters assume or reject her position and harm themselves in the process. Agnes's confinement to bed may reflect gender roles and expectations for women about sex, childbirth, and death. Author Brigitte Steen dis disputed what she called Mellon's Marxist feminist analysis, cross-referencing Bergman's realistic and metaphorical films to say that they are not the product of a sexist outlook. And you got to understand that this movie came out at a time when, 
you know, women were demanding, you know, reproductive rights. Women were demanding freedom to escape from the um, uh, from the domestic dungeon of a kitchen. You know, after the feminine Myst uh, feminine mystique by Betty Friedan came out in '62, it just changed everything. And look, I have a minor in women's studies, and a lot of films that center on women characters, particularly powerful women characters. Uh, those are the movies that I um, that I really, really get into and I really, really champion. Now, these women, I mean, the two sisters, at least, they're not powerful so much as they're just, you know, um, here again, like I said, that they're, they're, they're um, another crimson transition, another one that they're, you know, they're uber privileged, you know, and they really show it. in the second half of this, uh, of this movie, like I said, I just, neither of these actresses with their performances did anything for me. And I'm sure, you know, Ingmar Bergman, and I'm sure other critics and scholars would tell me, well, look, you know, you know, here's some subtext for you. You know, you know, let's uh, let's look at the let's analyze this relationship between the sisters anymore. No, look, the truth of the matter is I found their discussions, you know, endless and pointless, you know, and a lot of times they would just say, you know, the same things <clears throat> uh, in different scenes. And, okay, now one thing I haven't mentioned yet, because, well, okay, when we get to it, because there, the climax of this movie has actually been compared to, of all things, zombie cinema. And uh, like I said, we'll get to it. And I have to confess, I have to confess, even though I could see that scene working in, in 1972, I just kind of laughed. I, 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 found it, I found it actually uh, unintentionally funny. And I'm, I know Bergman did not intend, intend that. I know that the, none of the actors intended that. Uh, but at the same time, it's it, it just the second half of the movie just really, really, I think, is a, a downward spiral. And, you know, at this point, I don't care about any of the themes or the illusions. Okay, I just, I, it sucks that I got to deal with these two sisters that are just not likable in the slightest. There's not anything about these two sisters that I latched onto uh, to give them, you know, some kind of some kind of sense that the audience is supposed to really, really feel for them. And I get it, you know, they just lost their sister and everything after you know several painful years of what she was going to, through with the uterine cancer and everything. But uh, yeah, like the wine is supposed to represent all the blood coming from her vagina and all that. Okay, fine, 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 fine. Look, it does nothing for me. It just doesn't. Even if I didn't make the distinction between, like I said, the bottle of uh, the, the cup of wine breaking and it's supposed to represent, you know, the, the blood escaping from the uh, from the womb or whatever. You know, it's just. No, it, it does nothing for me. You know, and, you know, obviously she's very reserved and everything because A, she cannot have sex with her husband and B, you know, she had her vulva cut. So, I mean, it just, here again, drags on. I mean, we, we have to have, we have to showcase him taking a long drink of the wine. We have to see him, you know, put a napkin to his lips. We don't need any of this. I mean, I mean, I think Bergman could have gotten gotten his points and themes a lot, a lot more, had he just trimmed these scenes and got rid of what I think is unnecessary fat. And and that's the thing is that just I, I really after a while got really tired of these color schemes. You know, the constant crimson, the 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 transitions, which look the same almost every single time. And, and just, you know, okay, fine. I mean, we, I mean, even if you understand what she's going through and what she's experiencing and, and, you know, and everything, it still doesn't do a lot for me. It's still, I mean, you know, this woman is just too uh, damn, she's too much of a monolith for me to really care about. She really is. 
Now, here again, another very, very striking image through the use of mirrors in, in this scene between uh, Anna, Anna and Katrine. Uh, critic Marco Lanzagorda wrote, undeniably cries and whispers is a film about the world of women and is very open in terms of the gender and sexual politics that it portrays. The story fits Bergman's motif of, quote, warring women, seen earlier in The Silence and Persona and later in Autumn Sonata. The film inspired essays about Bergman's view of women. Patricia Ehrens wrote, Bergman's women in such films as Persona and Cries and Whispers are not simply objects of abuse but creatures through whom Bergman can express his own subjective fears, his many frustrations and failures at preserving autonomy of self and control of reality. And here again, I mean, look, look, obviously, look, I'm in the minority here. There's been a lot written about this movie. There's been a lot of critics that have examined this film inside it out. And, you know, they've come up with, you know, a lot of, very interesting, you know, opinions. Like, okay, critic Molly Haskell assigned Cries and Whispers to Bergman's later filmography, which differ from his earlier works in the view of women. Women in his early films lived in harmony with each other and in more complete lives. Bergman used the women in Cries and Whispers in his later films as, quote, projections of his soul, uh, revealing his sexual vanity. Here again, part of me just doesn't really care. According to Haskell, Bergman attacked his female characters for the attributes he gave them, Karen's repression and Maria's sexuality. <laughs> so, yeah. And in 1972, Variety staff defined Bergman's, quote, lean style as including a, quote, use of lingering close-ups, fades to red, and a soundtrack echoing with the ticking of clocks the rustle of dresses and the hushed cries of the lost. And let's see. Um, do, 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 do. According to Richard Armstrong, the Eastman color added a livid, slightly oniric quality. Two rooms in the first scene, one where Maria is sleeping, the other being Agnes's room, are joined by the same colors, including blood red carpets and drapes and white pillows and night dresses. Now, yeah, you know, obviously, like a lot of horror, films, the crimson is supposed to just represent blood, basically. Uh, Wilson observed that the film has fade ins and fade outs and saturated reds, too many of them, I think. And uh, so, uh, there are moves from red with white to red with black to orange to ochre in the final autumnal outdoor scene. Blood, seen when Maria's husband injures himself and Karen cuts her vulva, echo, echoes an earlier view of the mother character holding a red book against her dress. Sydney associates this with menstruation and castration. Wilson described other uses of imagery. Let's see, here, here's where she cuts her vulva. Yeah, it's... Um, ugh, man. And as somebody else, uh, or as, uh, as some of the critics rightfully noted, uh, who was it that... Okay. <laughs> I loved what uh, Time Out's uh, review said, uh, that uh, they called the film a, quote, red herring, uh, pun intended, I'm sure, uh, compared to Bergman's pure psychological dramas. And in a 2015 Slant Mu Magazine review, Clayton Dillard expressed disappointment in Agnes's cancer not being depicted as such, with her expressing passion-like pain instead, and Karen's self-harm not being clearly explained. Bingo. Bingo. Yep. Uh, now, <laughs> now, when this film was released in 1972, like I said, the uh, reaction to it was uh, quite unanimous. Uh, let's see. In Sweden, Savenska Dagbladat critic 
Ake Johnson and Dagen's Nahaiter critic Hanserik Jurten assessed Cries and Whispers as a poetically rendered psychological study. Critic O. Foss wrote a less positive review in Fant, calling it a rhapsody of petrified Bergman themes. See, I'm more inclined to believe that as well. Ugh. Yeah, I really want to see this film again after seeing something like this. I mean, look, I mean, I could, look, I, do I think Bergman was just trying to shock the audience? No, I, I don't think that Bergman was just trying to shock the audience. This is not like the other side of Midnight where somebody uses a uh, a wire hanger for a self-induced abortion, okay? He's not, okay, Bergman is not Sidney Sheldon, okay? I, I, I admit that, I acknowledge that. But by God, I mean, just the second half of the movie just really, really grinds my gears. You know, I get, um, you know, the, the sisters and their performances, nothing. They, 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 I mean, they are completely cold, uh, completely cold to me. There, there's just nothing about their relationship that I find compelling. There's nothing about their performances or the actresses that I find empathetic. It just, we seem to drone on with these women as they deal with this death. And it's just, ugh. and look, I'm open to movies about people dying of cancer. Uh, two of my favorite movies about people dying of cancer are One True Thing with Meryl Streep and Life is a House with Kevin Klein. And, you know, even movies like uh, We Need to Talk About Kevin, which use a overabundance of red to showcase the blood of Okay, spoilers. It showcases the blood of uh, high school students that uh, Ezra Miller, or rather his character, all uh, uh, murdered with uh, with uh, archery, with um, arrows and stuff. Um, you know, the, the, I mean, okay, fine. Yeah, the blood is supposed to represent in that movie. It's supposed to represent all the students and 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 you know how they died in the gymnasium. Here, all the blood is supposed to represent, uh, like I said, like Katrine cutting her vulva and. Um, you know, Agnes's, uh, uh, you know, uh, cancer and everything, you know, her, her issues and everything. So, I mean, look, I understand, I get it. Okay. The red is supposed to represent, um, the blood coming out of all these women or within these women. And look, even in, we need to talk about Kevin, even in that movie, there is restraint with the red, even in that movie. I mean, yes, every scene has a little bit of red, but there's always other colors. There's always other colors around. Here, all we have are white, crimson, and flesh tones. That's all we got. And, and that's what I'm saying is that this is, I mean, look, it, it's not a black and white movie. It's a crimson and white movie. And to me, that's not nearly enough. In 72, obviously critics were balled over by this. I am not. I, I mean, it just, no. And here again, that it's a strong first half, strong first half. There are undeniable images in this movie, none of which I'll remember. But yes, there are striking images throughout this movie. Just like these two women, you know, they just keep on talking and talking. And I just, I get nothing out of their dialogue. I get nothing out of their performances. It's just really. Uh, the film was generally praised in the United States. In the New York Times, Vincent Canby called it a magnificent, moving, and very mysterious new film. He included the film in his list of the 10 best films of 1972. Roger Ebert gave Cries and Whispers four stars in his initial review. Quote, we slip lower in our seats, feeling claustrophobia and sexual disquiet, realizing that we've been surrounded by the vision of a filmmaker who has absolute mastery of his art. Well, I agree with the second half of that. <laughs> I agree with the second half of that quote. Uh, in, in New York Magazine, Judith Chris called it a work of genius. Certainly the most complex, the most perceptive, and the most humane of Bergman's works to date. Francois Truffaut made a theatrical comparison, saying that the film begins like Chekhov's Three Sisters and ends like the Cherry Orchard, and in between it's more like Strindberg. And by the way, Roger Ebert called it, uh, declared Cries and Whispers as the 
best film of 1972. Empire critic uh, David Parkinson gave Cries and Whispers five stars in 2000, writing that the film is a subset of character study at which Bergman was adept. Uh, Ebert added it to his great movies list in 2002, writing that to watch the film is, quote, to touch the extremes of human feeling. It is so personal, so penetrating in privacy that we almost want to look away. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily want to look away as I just wanted the movie to be over. <laughs> uh, James uh, Bernadelli praised Anderson's performance as, quote, so powerful that we feel like intruders watching it. She screams, she whimpers, she begs, she cries, she craves death and fears it. And now this whole thing right here, like, I can't stand it. It's con constant anguish. It's like being in hell. Yeah, that's how I felt about cries and whispers after an hour and seven minutes, which we just hit the hour and seven minute mark, she completely summed up my feelings about cries and whispers at this point. I'm just like, no, just end this already. I don't want to watch these people anymore. I really, really don't. <laughs> uh, Zendri Svard Krona's 2003 Aftonbladet review called it a masterpiece with wonderful aesthetics but unpleasant subject matter. Mm -hmm. Citing Nick Vist and Anderson, uh, Emmanuel Levy praised the film's cinematography. Here again, Sven Nick Vist won an Oscar. I do think that Oscar was deserved. And the performances of the female leads calling the result a masterpiece in 2008. Here again, unlike many critics, I do not think this is a masterpiece. In fact, I think it's far from it. Uh, Cries and Whispers ranked 154th in the British Film Institute Sight and Sound Critics Poll, the greatest films ever made. And Leonard Maltin gave the film three stars in his movie guide praising its visuals, but cautioning viewers about the large amount of dialogue. Now, that's an interesting reaction because, you know, the first nine minutes have no dialogue. And there's even a few scenes scattered throughout this movie that have not a single word of dialogue. But then we get to a sequence like this, um, you know, where you know, this very long uh, dinner conversation where they talk about what they're going to do with Anna. She wants to give her a small compensation and basically move her on her very way. Uh, despite the fact that they took care of her sister when she was dying and uh, her own child died in the household. So their, their treatment of her, you know, at the end here is just kind of, it, it, I mean, it just made me more upset with them as people than I did even before. You know, their, their whole uh, treatment of, uh, of, the, uh, of the housemaid, Anna, after all she went through. I mean, you know, who knows, what the, who knows how deep the relationship was between uh, Anna and Agnes. But it's almost like that they're completely, uh, you know, they, 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 they're acting like they have absolutely no idea that they had this special relationship. Even though she says, well, maybe we should have her keep one of Agnes's uh, mementos or whatever. It's like, oh, well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I mean, maybe if you hired her wherever you guys are going, knowing that she's been a, a devoted uh, uh, maid all throughout these years, maybe I would care just a tad more. But, the, but they're so cold and indifferent that it just makes me dislike them even more. My husband says I'm clumsy. <laughs> Do we care? Do we really fucking care? I mean, I, not just, like I said, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry to get really negative in the second half of this movie. But like I said, I just can't stand these people. I can't stand these two sisters. I mean, here again, despite all the tragedy that they have endured, despite the suffering that they have endured, I find absolutely nothing about these people likable. I find absolutely nothing about these two people empathetic. Nothing. I mean, to me, they're just, um, you know, they're going to move to where they're ever going to move to and continue their, their, their uneventful lives with probably very little, uh, you know, confrontation or, or, or uh, you know, anything. I mean, I don't know. I mean, these, these women just have absolutely no uh, shades of, of gray or shades of purple or they, they just, no, they, 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 there's nothing to them. 
And I know every every historian will get on me. It's like, well, no, you just didn't like you just didn't like them. You didn't appreciate their relationships and their and the themes and the symbols and everything. Eh, whatever, just whatever. I can't stand these people. <laughs> yeah, I have to feel so bad for her because he cut, she cut her vulva when she did it herself. Like, you know. It's like earlier when I didn't give a damn about uh, the husband stabbing himself because, uh, you know, his, you know, just... here again. I mean, they feel like false attempts. I, 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 I mean, they really feel like false attempts at caring about these people. And like I said, nothing. I, I get nothing from these uh, from these two sisters. Anna and Agnes, sure, I felt for for them. Um, more or less. These two sisters, absolutely not. God, she just has a wicked face. Look at that. I mean, why does she have a face that's so damn wicked? I mean, Liv Ullman is at least somewhat attractive. <laughs> now, okay, did we... I don't think we talked much. I think, okay, we still need to get out of the way... Um, See, the actress Ingrid Thulin, uh, she uh, passed away in 2004 at the age of 77. Uh, she was often cast as harrowing or desperate characters. Harrowing and desperate characters, not heroin. Har harrowing. Uh, she was often cast as, uh, you know, and earned acclaim from both Swedish and international critics. She won the Cannes Film Festival Award for Best Actress for her performance in 1958's Brink of Life and the inaugural Gilda Bag Award for Best Actress in a Leading Role for The Silence, directed by Ingmar Bergman in 1960, uh, 1963. And she was also nominated for a BAFTA for this film, Cries and Whispers. Here again, don't quite agree with it, but whatever. Uh, for many years, she worked regularly with Ingmar Bergman. She appeared in Wild Strawberries, The Magician, in which she spent most of the film dressed as a boy. Winter Light, The Silence, The Right, and, and Cries and Whispers. Uh, uh, in 1968, she was cast as Lucino Visconti in his uh, historical epic of Nazi Germany, The Damned. Uh, Thulin's performance earned a National Society of Film Critics Award for Best Actress. Winner of the David D. Dantello Awards 1974. Thulin also was nominated for the BAFTA Award the same year. In 1980, she had the head of the jury at the 30th Berlin International Film Festival. And uh, let's see, and she herself died of cancer in Stockholm uh, 20, uh, 20, 20 days before her 70th birthday, 78th birthday. The municipality of Soleftia where Thulin is buried, has given an Ingrid Thulin Memorial Scholarship annually since 2008. The scholarship, which is valued at uh, 20,000 kroner, is open to any applicants pursuing the arts. It is sponsored by Harriet Anderson, who plays Agnes, of course, uh, Thulin's longtime personal friend. And like I said, here we have an endless sequence where they keep on touching each other and talking. Touching and talking, touching and talking, touching and talking. And here again, me being in the minority, I get I got nothing out of this. After viewing it twice, just got absolutely nothing. Another uh, more crimson transitions, you know. I mean, just after a while, it's just like, come on. Ugh. Uh, Ingrid Thulin was also in uh, the 1962 version of Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, directed by Vincent Minnelli. She also was in the 1966 film Night Games, uh, Salon Kitty, 1976. Uh, that was directed by uh, Tinto Brass, who would later uh, direct uh, uh, Caligula with uh, <laughs> Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> and uh, her last film role was in 1991 in a movie called the House of Smiles. Uh, that was an Italian film where she was, in fact, the star. She was, in fact, the star of that movie. So she, um, yeah, and then in 1991 uh, or 2004, like I said, she passed away at the age of 77. So she lived for a good um, 13 years after her uh, last film appearance. There's a picture I see of her right here from 1952. It's like, wow. 
<laughs> she was gorgeous back then. And then, of course, they, uh, you know, Bergman kind of uglified her for this movie, I think, for, you know, a variety of reasons. <laughs> and let's see, uh, 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 I think I've covered, I've covered pretty much all of the actors. And it should be noted that uh, uh, Maria's daughter, who we saw in the picture uh, at the beginning of the film, when she was doing, you know, her prayer and everything, uh, that was Lynn Ullman in the picture. She is the daughter of both Liv and uh, Ingmar Bergman, and Ingmar Ingmar Bergman's other daughter, Lena, from a pre from another marriage. Uh, she plays young, the young version of Maria. Now, and this fact kind of blew my mind a little bit, but uh, Ingmar Bergman initially said that he hoped Mia Farrow would be in the film. Quote, let's see if that works out. It probably will. Why shouldn't it? However, Farrow was never cast. Uh, instead, we have uh, Carrie Silwan to play Anna. So Mia Farrow was, was going to play this role. Mia Farrow was indeed going to play this role. Now, Okay, I did like that close-up where you did see the, the tears coming out. But admittedly, one thing I didn't expect was for her to actually start talking. Now, at first, and here again, I will give Ingmar Bergman this much credit. When this scene started, I, I seriously thought that Anna was having, like, you know, just basically a, a, a conversation with her uh, where she was just dead. But we hear... Agnes's voice and this is where this is where it comes into play where you know like that what one person said well this is essentially a zombie movie <laughs> which I guess I mean this scene I mean this suggests it's a zombie movie but I mean well and there is blood there is blood admittedly but <laughs> I mean, look, I'm sorry. I cannot consider this a zombie movie in any sense of the word. I mean, despite this scene. Okay, I understand where they're coming from, but come on. Let, let's, you know, I mean, <laughs> try showing this to a zombie fan and tell me that they, they will have the same reaction to it and say, oh, yeah, that's a zombie classic, total zombie classic. We, sh we should watch it with, uh, Dawn of the Dead. You know, that's how good it is, right? <laughs> Uh, now, okay. Although Agnes's apparent resurrection may reflect Anna's fear or desire, like I said, I, I initially I thought this was Anna just you know having a, her own little conversation with her, even though she's already dead. But uh, Emma Wilson wrote that it blurred the fine line between life and dream and, and might involve supernatural activity. Ingmar Bergman basically says, quote, death is the ultimate loneliness. That is what is so important. Agnes's death has been caught up halfway out into the void. I can't see that there's anything odd about that. Yes, by Christ, there is. This situation has never been known, either in reality or at the movies. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Tornquist advised against a literal reading of Agnes rising from the dead, relating it to the sister's guilt. According to Sidney, the statue in the... Oh, oh no, we already covered that. Um, and Torquist also wrote that Agnes's prolonged pain and death resemble the passion of Jesus. Yeah. And Wilson compared the position of Agnes's arms and legs to Jesus's body after his passion. Godot also saw parallels to the crucifixion of Jesus in flashbacks to Good Friday and a mention of Twelfth Night at the end of the film, which he considered ironic since Twelfth Night is associated with Revelation. The Magic Lantern show takes place on Twelfth Night. In fact, they even mentioned that on screen. Sidney, Rocheman, and Irving Singer describe the scene where Anna cradles Agnes as a reminiscent of Pieta, with Langzagora specifying Michelangelo's Pieta. According to academic Arthur Gibson, the Pieta right becomes redemption. Quote, Anna is holding in her, in her arms the pain and loneliness and sin of the world caught up in the innocent divine sufferer. Unquote. Now, 
Believe it or not, Cries and Whispers was rejected by every major studio in the United States. Uh, and guess who was the one that distributed uh, uh, by uh, putting up double the budget to do advertising for it? Roger Corman. No, for real. Crimes and Whispers was initially re released in the United States by Roger Corman's New World Pictures. So, if you are a fan of this film and you love Bergman, uh, you should write... Uh, <laughs> You should write. Um, uh, you should write uh, uh, Roger Corman a thank you letter. <laughs> you should. You really should. Uh, uh, the U.S. rights were bought by Roger Corman's New World Picture for one hundred and fifty thousand. Corman spent additional eighty thousand on marketing. According to the producer, the film made a profit of one million and was Bergman's biggest success in the United States. Author Tina Baleo reported a U.S. gross of 1.2 million from 800 theaters, called it Bergman's best performing film since The Silence back in 1963. To qualify for the 46 Academy Awards, distributors hurried to premiere Cries and Whispers in Los Angeles County several months before its Swedish release, and it premiered in New York City on the 21st of December, 1972. At the 61st Berlin International Film Festival in February of 2011, uh, with, with uh, Harriet Anderson in, in attendance, Cries and Whispers was screened in the retrospective section. In 2015, the Criterion Col uh, Collection released a 2K restoration on Blu-ray. And by the way, if anybody is really interested in picking up the uh, Blu-ray for um, uh, Cries and Whispers, hey, look. Don't let me stop you. Don't let me stop you uh, uh, one bit. Uh, let me see. What the uh, the extras are on the Blu-ray real quick. Because I'll tell you right now, I am not buying the Blu-ray. I'm not buying this on Blu-ray or DVD. But uh, for those of you who are interested... Uh, you get a new 2K digital restoration with uncompressed monaural soundtrack on the Blu-ray. Introduction by director Ingmar Bergman from 2001. New interview with actor Harriet Anderson, conducted by historian Peter Cowie. On, Sol on Solace, a new video essay by filmmaker Kogo Nada. Behind-the-scenes footage with commentary by Peter Cowie. Ingmar Bergman, Reflections on Life, Death, and Love, with Erlen Josephson from 2000, a 52-minute interview with Bergman and his longtime collaborator. And you also get a new English subtitle translation, optional English dubbed soundtrack, and plus an essay by film scholar Emma Wilson, and of course a new cover by Sarah Habibi, which, like I said, is basically just Agnes's face with the crimson all over it <laughs> all right we just passed well we're coming up here on the one hour and 24 minute mark in 30 seconds we have approximately seven minutes left to go we have approximately seven minutes left to go uh with crimes and whispers and just to close everything out let me go to um this uh, trivia section real quick Yeah, I like how the first review on IMDb, it's just death, pain, grief, guilt, and love. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it didn't work for me. <laughs> but uh, let's see. <clears throat> the only Best Picture Oscar nom nominated film directed by legendary director Ingmar Bergman. And by the way, it should be noted that this was the fourth film that got a Best Picture nomination for a uh, fourth foreign language film. Uh, the first one was actually Grand Illusion back in 1937, directed by Rene Clair. And then we also had Costa Gavras's uh, Z from 1969. And finally, The Immigrants uh, from 1971. 
So this was the fourth film to get a Best Picture nomination that came from another country. And of course, that record has, of course, been broken since then because we just had, um, uh, was it Parasite uh, win Best Picture? And that movie came from South Korea. The film's Best Picture Oscar nomination was the only nomination in such a category for a New World Pictures release in the company's lifetime. But here again, I'd rather watch most uh, m most other <laughs> most other uh, New World Pictures. I mean, give, give me Tough Turf. Give me give me uh, uh, um, a Strip to Kill. You know, give me the Velvet Vampire. You know, which I did a commentary last year and i still have the shirt for uh, look give me most new world films over crimes and whispers and look you know who knows may maybe somebody will reach out to me and try to convince me otherwise look you know it, try watching it again with these factors in mind maybe maybe not my assessment of this film is pretty um it's pretty final it, it's pretty final in that here again Striking imagery throughout, uh, really good music by Chopin and Bach, and you know, like I said, well deserved Oscar for its cinematography, and a mostly, if not entirely, strong first half. But then we get into the second half with the conversations about death and love, and blah, blah, blah. and I, my interest was completely lost at that point. And here again. The most controversial thing I, I'm going to say is that I wasn't impressed by either performances by Liv Alderman and, um, yeah, I was impressed by neither of them. That's the truth. I, I did not care for what they were talking about. I didn't care what uh, they were expressing thematically. I didn't care about what ultimately happened to them or what would ultimately happen to them later in life. I just didn't care. And, you know, people will say, well, look, I mean, you know, the, the reason why this film touched non-Swedish audiences was primarily because of these relationships. And it probably struck a chord with women in the early 70s. Um, you know, I could definitely see why it would. With me, I just felt empty at the end. I, I felt empty. I felt, uh, you know, I, I just felt it kind of fell flat. You know, it just... Despite the imagery, despite the imagery, despite the, the, you know, the use of the crimson, which here again, I think is repetitive in terms of the, uh, you know, the transitions and everything. A, I got to admit a, not a bad film, certainly. I mean, I think it's okay, but man, I found it a massive disappointment. I really just found this a massive disappointment. And here again, I will say it one more time. I've liked other films with these themes. I've liked other films uh, with, um, you know, tragedies such as cancer and people dying of cancer and, you know, things like that, loss of children. You know, look, other stories can, can uh, speak to me and, and grab my attention and make me and touch my soul uh, with those themes and with those performances and everything. This movie, no, it fell short. I, I personally thought it fell short. And um, a lot of people who, uh, I mean, a lot of um, lovers of film love this film. A lot of people that uh, today, you know, in their re uh, retrospectives, you know, they keep on saying masterpiece, 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 masterpiece. No way I can join that crowd. There's just no way I can uh, uh, join them in their um practically unanimous praise of Cries and Whispers. We, are, we were able to take a stroll together. It was a wonderful experience. Yeah. All right, ladies, let's, let's hurry it up now. Let's end this. <laughs> Let, let's just end this already. <laughs> we got one minute left. And here we have the, the, the final scene with basically all four of the actresses. Uh, you know, all my aches and pains are gone. The people I'm most fond of in the, all the world were with me. 
And I've heard this dialogue before in many other films of people in, in similar predicaments. I could feel the presence of their bodies, the warmth of their hands. I wanted to cling to that moment I thought, oh, come what may, this is happiness. I can't wish for anything better. Look, people were obviously touched by this, okay? I, I, I'm Believe me, I, people were obviously touched by this story and by these women. I wasn't one of them. I, I just want it wasn't one of them. So I hate to say it, but I can't necessarily not recommend this movie. Thus the cries and whispers fall silent. And now we've reached the very, very end of crimes and whispers. So look, ladies and gentlemen, look, I understand that I was kind of negative on this movie. I wasn't expecting to get this negative, but look, I'm just being honest here. I'm just being honest. Strong first half, rather dismal second half where as potent as the themes were, it didn't grab me. It ultimately just did not grab me, and I found it a disappointment. But look, you know, watch it on Amazon Prime. If you love the film, pick up the criteria. You know, uh, just want to say hi to uh, Christian Hannah Horner. Horror, always lovely to see you, sir, as well as Daniel Shine. And, of course, Cliff Booth. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, you know, well... Cries and Whispers was, wasn't exactly a film that I think a lot of people were clamoring for. But look, it, it's from 1972. It's an international movie. I had to do it. And so all I'm saying is, in closing, uh, please... Oh, uh, you're very welcome, Rod. Thank you so much for coming in as well. So look, I hate to disappoint uh, anybody out there who is hoping for a commentary on scenes uh, from a marriage next year. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Maybe in 10 years, I'll do a commentary for Fanny and Alexander. Maybe. Maybe I will. But on that note, uh, I will go ahead and uh, leave you all for tonight. You all have a wonderful evening. Thank, thank you again for listening. And um, you all have a great uh, evening. Thank you so much. Take care.